Support for Lab Out Loud is brought to you by the National Science Teachers Association. Find out more at nsta.org. You're listening to the Lab Out Loud podcast, Science for the Classroom and Beyond. And in today's show, we're talking about a new NSTA position statement. You know, the idea is really helping students to evaluate the credibility of, of sources. We can look at a source. We, we can look at where they're coming from and evaluate how much weight we should put on a particular statement. That's up next on Lab Out Loud. But first, I'm your co-host, Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell. You know, in the world of memes being exchanged constantly, I am sure there are a bunch of memes that are for and against the topic that we're going to be talking today about. I am starting to see memes everywhere. It's like, are, are we are we going to see this in textbooks coming out soon? Where, you know, because, we'll, you know, every now and then we'll have like a far side comic in a textbook or something. And, you know, it, it'll just take a few years to penetrate. We'll start to see memes is my guess in textbooks. I think science teachers shouldn't use memes. I'm making a my position statement today. Dale's they position statements. Science teachers should not use memes, and here's why. Because they require no scientific background. They require no evidence. They are only claims. That's all they are. And they take the same information, whether it's a picture or whatever, and just they just make a they make a claim, blah, claim, and they add a picture, they add some a couple a series of pictures to kind of stir emotion, and then that claim just gets passed around and it leaves behind the evidence and reasoning. It just basically memes are are counter are are the are, are they, they they like eat evidence and reasoning. Oh. You can you've been thinking so, about this a lot. I have, I have, because they are they're little monsters that just basically just dispose of evidence and reasoning because all it is is just a claim factory and then it gets circulated and our students i mean when i say students i'm thinking my own children because now they're little they're high schoolers you know i have a ninth grader two ninth graders and a and a 10th uh 11th grader i forgot yeah. my own children and and they are trading memes just like ha look at this ha ha pass it on ha look at this pass it on and then you know it's the same thing like oh i saw this online pass it on and it's like this is perpetuating a problem well and, and beyond what, that, and what can a teacher do really, <laughs> right well and i would actually argue maybe teachers shouldn't use memes either because even though they are these catchy little tidbits of current you know modern culture uh, they are like you said they they don't have they're just claims they don't have the evidence behind it but furthermore they're they're off well there's a copyright issue i guess we could say but uh, we we want students to make sure that the media that they're sharing, I mean, we, we, are, we talk about the importance of communicating with multimodal communication, so using uh-huh. other tools. If they're just doing a quick, like, boom, here you go, there's no looking at the ethics behind it. There's no looking at the evidence behind it. I guess if memes did have that, maybe they would have a, a place there. But other, as you said, uh, students are just kind of uh, regurgitating these things out they're spreading them they're sharing them and there's no no substantial kind of meat behind oh them. yeah and let's not beat up on kids it's certainly adults that are passing these around too um yeah i i don't disagree with the fact that i mean the problem is that memes are kind of fun and some of them are funny and things like that but the the issue is that they play in the same playground of disinformation and and that's a uh, essentially our our guests um not talking about memes today, but, but <laughs> if but, you do want to talk our, about memes in science, maybe we should but, have this as another show. But yeah, yeah but the work that our guest uh, had a hand in and had a hand in leading made me think about memes because I think that's what's contributing to it. But it, it was basically about disinformation and um, what NSTA has done throughout the years of basically setting um, the stage and saying, here is a position that you guys can use as a resource. Well, we, we know that NSTA has a series of position statements, and, and if I guess if you don't, we'll provide a link in the show notes. But we connected with Eric Pyle. He is from James Madison University, and he had a substantial hand in crafting the newest position statement on teaching climate science. 
position statements in general uh, are organizations basically saying what they believe, what they uh, stand for, what is going to be best practice in their fields, and and to some extent what we are staking our reputation on. Um, so this one in particular, though, addresses a very important issue, really, to help teachers see how to deal with what would otherwise be considered a very controversial issue. But uh, really, the, the controversies, controversies for this one, uh, this particular position statement, uh, are really this, the context that surrounds things. So we want to have teachers have the best available tools, the clearest message, not just for what they can teach, how they should approach teaching uh, the issues, particularly of climate change, uh, but also what are the support structures they need? What should they be asking for or expecting of their administrators, uh, of parents, uh, policymakers in general? Mm -hmm. Do you have some examples for listeners that might not be familiar with the NSTA position statements? What other position statements have um, been out there for a while? Uh, well, there are a number of them about uh, multicultural science education. There are uh, there's a position statement on pre-service uh, science teacher preparation. There is uh, one on the uh, the importance of teaching science in elementary school. Sure. Um, so there's a long list of them on the website, and uh, the challenge is keeping them up to date. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And we will, well, it's actually funny. I, first of all, listeners, we will put a link to this in the show notes, but there are quite a few there that are, they have like little tags under development, new, under revision, newly revised. Safety, so, science safety is one of them too, I'm sure, right? Uh, science safety. Safety yeah. in, science, in school science instruction. Uh, mm -hmm. teaching of evolution, uh, you know, these are all things that teachers need, you know, it, it might be an issue that they'll have to deal with and how do they make their decisions? Well, NSTA is providing uh, the, a, a backstop, the science, solid scientific foundation for things, uh, helping to make it an available to teachers in a way that speaks to them. It's that professional standard that a teacher can refer to, which is particularly important for a teacher who's, let's say, an earth science teacher in a school district where they're the only earth science teacher. Who do you turn to? Well, and by the same token, uh, they might be a teacher teaching out of field. Um, you know, I... Oh, my, yeah, good point. I myself, when I was a classroom teacher, uh, I was teaching earth science, but I also taught chemistry and physics and the odd algebra course. So, you know, things that, yes, I understand those, but yes, there are issues that come up and I'd like to stay out ahead of, uh, you know, tomorrow. I'd like to plan next week and next month as well. <laughs> that, no, that's a, I think that's a great point, especially as we're starting to see some of the uh, I, and maybe it's a nationwide trend to see some teachers of science that are out of their field more and more um, as we are looking for uh, teachers to replace the ones that have uh, just recently left. Yeah. Well, another important thing about these position statements, and again, this is the support for teachers, particularly those that are out of field, is it, it helps them make choices about selecting professional development opportunities, how their supervisors might organize professional development opportunities for them. I mean, at the local level, they should know who their teachers are and who is or is not out of field, but really... Uh, not having their science knowledge and their knowledge of teaching science uh, locked in at graduation. You know, mm -hmm. teachers need ongoing professional development like any profession and uh, position statements such as this one help to focus what that professional development should look like. I like the support structures in here um, and in it, it's mentioned to support the work of teachers of science. NSTA recommends that school administrators, school boards, and school and district leaders, and there, there's a few bullet points underneath that. Um, I'm curious, is this something that you would recommend teachers maybe printing off and uh, handing to their administrators or their school board? Absolutely. I mean, it is formatted in a way that, yes, it is a very lengthy position statement. And, uh, you know, you, you might... But it comes off in a nice PDF. Yes, it does. It comes off in a nice PDF and there is something that they can highlight. They can focus in on. Here is something for you, uh, principal. Here is something for you, school board. Here is something for you, parents. 
Um, here is something for you, media representatives. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah that's so, a good point. <laughs> I think he's Let's talking to us, the- Dale. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into the weeds a little bit about the newest one now. Um, what is it and how did it get on the table? Well, uh, this one, it, it, it's very interesting. I had served on the board of directors at the time this issue came up. Uh, I was the division director for pre-service teacher preparation. And uh, at, at a board meeting, we were considering the lengthy list of position statements that needed uh, revision and updating. Certainly at the advent of the next generation science standards and uh, the framework for K-12 science education really forced us to look at things even just at a, at a basic structural level, mm-hmm. you know. And so it was a very daunting list, but then it's also, well, what don't we have a position statement on? And one of the ones that stood out, one of the areas that stood out was on teaching climate science and climate change. NSTA had resources available for these things, but uh, the board realized right away that this was an important issue that NSTA needed to take some leadership on. And so we voted on this position that we would uh, put this one to the top of the list. And uh, by unanimous vote, we put it forward. Um, now, I was I was quite pleased to be asked to be part of the committee drafting it. And then I, I was contacted uh, and I asked, you know, OK, so who else is on it? And the list of names of people that were part of this uh, group was very impressive. I know many of them and have worked with them. And, you know, wow, what a pleasure to be working with these people. And are you sure I'm okay to be with this? And they said, well, <laughs> yes. And we'd like you to lead it. <laughs> Ooh. Be, you know, the, the, the thing that's very important about this is it requires a, a focus on science as well as a focus on education. You know, it would, it would be very easy to, as you say, get into the weeds and just talk about climate change. Uh, Or it would be Uh very easy to just talk about science teaching, but here we're having to focus on two things. You know, you can imagine a Venn diagram, where do these things overlap? Uh You know, drawing in the expertise of scientists and science teachers and science educators, um, both formal and informal, uh, you know, it, 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 it worked very well. It took us a little while uh, but I think we did focus in on what would a teacher need, you know, not okay. just not just at the classroom level, but also, as you see, the supporting structures. Uh, there was so much material that it couldn't all fit in the position statement itself. And so if you uh, scroll down the page, you'll see there are some supplemental uh, documents. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is sort of a blog that uh, NSTA organized with some of us that um, – uh, were part of it. And then there's another lengthy document, which is sort of, you know, exploring these ideas a little bit, you know, so what about cognitive bias on some level? What about the time needed to teach this particular topic? It's not just a one topic thing that you talk about in uh, middle school uh, in grade six science. You know, it's something that has to be long term from elementary all the way up. Uh, and We're- Go ahead. Were there certain things that put um, this topic on the top of the list? Was there a sense of urgency or uh, things that were happening that that put it in this focus? Uh, not so directly, but you know, it, it we all recognize that this was very important. So it wasn't a res- necessarily res- response to something specific. It was sort of an ongoing thing. Like this one has been ruminating with us. Uh, yeah, I couldn't say that it was to, you know, any specific, uh, stimulus from the outside. Now, uh, you, you, Mary Gromko, who was president at the time, uh, or David Evans, the executive director, they might be aware of something directly, but as in terms of how it was presented to the board, the discussion was in general on position statements and saying, well, uh, here's a gap and, you know, we get asked for information on this, you know, that is NSTA gets asked for information and guidance uh, by teachers. Uh, so what are we going to have to say about it? Okay. So and how will this, how will this help teachers? What, um, is there a specific thing that they will be able to, a specific resource that's going to help them now? 
Well, what this does is it really helps to organize a lot of the things that NSTA has available and other stakeholders within this uh, endeavor. So NSTA uh, does publish a lot, uh, both in print and digital formats, and it will help to prioritize or, or actually shape how uh, proposals are developed on resources. Uh, another thing is with with our partners with with NOAA. Frank Neopold uh, from NOAA uh, was one of the scientists involved in this project, and uh, he's put together actually a little bit of a clearinghouse on uh, instructional resources now that can have a little bit of focus. It's uh, toolkit.climate.gov, and mm-hmm. wow, I mean, I use this with my classes with pre-service teachers. Um, amazing sort of uh, pool of resources, access to the range of resources that you can answer, not just, you know, specific sort of content questions, uh, but also how one might go about teaching a particular topic or, you know, the, the, there's a real danger that comes about in discussing climate change. And, and early on, we, we worked it out on the development of the position statement, and that is, uh, in expressing urgency, one can get into a very gloomy place very quickly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's like just, okay, wow, temperatures are going up. There's more energy in the system. We're going to get more extreme weather. We're doomed. And that's not the message that we want to convey. I mean, this is about empowerment, not just for the teachers themselves, but empowerment for students. What can you do something about? Um you know, what, what, what can you do? Uh, and, and so the idea of resilience comes about, you know, yes, mm-hmm. the, cli- the climate is changing. Maybe it's changing at a rate faster than we have ever noticed, um, you know, in the, in the past record. Uh, and, you know, there are some, some things that we're going to have to be on the lookout for. And so how do you deal with it? What, and, and so teachers are going to be able to be much more confident in what they convey to their their students and and not have them be cast into a slump or a sense of indifference because there's nothing they can do about it because well there actually is something they can do about it and so these resources that can now hang off the umbrella of the position statement uh you know, you know there's some organization there's some way to focus your question so that's you know how it helps teachers um, you know, directly, it, it, it helps them get past a lot of um, noise. Uh, it helps them to focus in on what's going to be best for their students. Mm-hmm. Sure. I did a quick scan through the document just to control F and searched for textbook. And knowing that uh, many teachers are dependent on a textbook for delivering their instruction and their curriculum, um, there's nothing in here that speaks to like the, the standard textbook. Is that intentional or an oversight? <laughs> well, you know, it's that's a really great question. I mean, we 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 think of instructional resources in general as encompassing textbooks and other sources. Sure. Um, so now, are you talking about the toolkit or uh, the position statement? Well, the, the the position statement itself. I mean, obviously, the the toolkit is. Uh, I guess part of my my question is kind of leading into we we know we have to probably rely on current and up to date information rather than something that might be a few years um, that were you know went to press a few years ago. Okay, no, it, it it it's it's accepting the fact that there are a broad range of materials, including textbooks. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about curricular materials, um, we're we're looking at that in a broad sense. The most important thing, though, is that uh, whatever the resource, it should be based on a solid footing. And we do make specific reference to uh, the framework for K-12 science education. I'd like to see that you have uh, an issue on media and how to address the media. This is in the declarations, and it says specifically... um, help students learn how to use scientific evidence to evaluate claims made by others, including those from media sources that may be politically or socially biased. 
And I like that statement a lot because I think uh, when I watch my local news, I usually see something that, you know, addresses both sides. And I think that there's a danger in that, obviously, that, you know, <laughs> clim- there's, there shouldn't be necessarily another side to climate science. It's climate science itself. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it, it comes down to, well, what is, in fact, the nature of the controversy? The science is the science. And it's not a scientific controversy. Uh, the controversy is built on uh, social discourse, uh, economic questions, uh, political concerns, and the idea that the, the idea of having that those declarations relative to the media is really helping students to uh, evaluate the credibility of of sources. I mean, I, I, um, there's a book that uh, I actually use with one class. Uh, it's called What's the Worst That Can Happen? Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It was written by yeah. a science te- a science teacher named Greg Craven. And he, oh boy, maybe uh, nine or ten years ago started this uh, these YouTube videos that were really sort of logic models on, well, what should we do about climate change? And, you know, the question is, is it happening or not? Uh, you know, he, he comes up with a decision grid. So, th- so the book sort of summarizes a lot of uh, the comments that he received on his series of YouTube videos. Uh, and you know, the idea is, well, we can look at a source. We we can look at where they're coming from and evaluate how much weight we should put on a particular statement. So, if I have a professional organization saying that uh, climate change is real that it has a human-induced cause, and that the whole organization is backing it, that has ought to have more credibility than the man on the street being asked, you know, what do you think, you know, our temperature's going up, you know? So, you know, a lay person versus uh, a whole body of scientists, for example. Yes, Mm -hmm. everyone has a voice, certainly, but how much credibility should you assign to that? And so the thing about the media is, all right, uh, students, let's see how do we uh, address a source and credibility. And it, it also creates an opportunity for seeing science not so isolated. Uh, that is, you, you, you can talk about uh, these issues in a math class, in a social studies class, uh, in, in an English class, in you know, a composition class of some sort. You know, how are arguments put together? Were there issues that um, science teachers brought up um, that were happening to them? Maybe obstacles that were preventing them from science teaching, um, excuse me, teaching climate science? Yeah, well, um, you know, yes, there, yes, there's pushback on that and any particular, you know, controversial issue there, there. There, you know, I will I can't give you a specific, you know, teacher A said this, but, you oh, know, sure. we do hear that, you know, there is pushback. Uh, and, and it takes that form of, well, maybe it's happening. Maybe it's not. Let's have a debate. Let's teach the controversy, yeah. you know, and, and that's the form of pushback there. And again, it's not a, it's not a scientific controversy. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and so it shouldn't be part of the science curriculum, but there are other opportunities to talk about, you know, what are the impacts of this, um, you know, it, it, it also helps us tie things together in, in a way to understand, you know, the Earth is not a simple linear system. It is actually a very complex system. And uh, there are uh, things that we can do or can't do, but it, 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 it's not just Earth science, for example. It is chemistry. It is physics. It is life science that ties in. And, you know, humans are a part of that mix. And it's a very complex mix. And so it is something that should be approached with eyes wide open, with a solid scientific footing. And then you can talk about what it means outside of the science. What kind of feedback have has NSTA received so far on the position statement? Well, like any position statement, um, it, it has to go out to the memberships. To the membership uh, for comment. So there is, it goes to the board of directors for review, for revision, back to the committee, then back to the board of directors. Uh, and if they're satisfied with it, then it goes out to the membership. 
And the reception, I mean, we didn't get nearly as many comments as we would like, but the reception was overwhelming. Like, thank you. This is what we needed. It's about time, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, it is, it, it, I mean, it was, it was vast majority uh, of very positive, very supportive comments. And, you know, it's, it tells us we're going in the right direction. Good. Where do you go from here? Is there? Well, you know, part of that is is making sure the teachers are aware of this, but teacher educators are aware of this as well. You know, and so these are the people that are not just preparing the teachers in college, but the people that provide the professional development. How do we connect with scientific organizations, scientific bodies that uh, have members that provide this? I mean, we, we, each of us that were part of the committee have our own network and we have been sharing this within our network. And again, the response has been very favorable. Um, I thought it was very interesting though, um, to, it, it, it's not been as wide as, as we would like in terms of the response. And so I really appreciate you guys reaching out to us. Sure. Um, but, uh, almost immediately upon the release of the position statement or some hours later there was a response from the heartland institute which agreed with the emphasis on evidence-based science and then they the state their statement can continued on to dismiss the evidence that supports climate change so (laughs) so there's there's a there's a little bit of cherry picking that's going on but on the same token um uh, earther.gizmodo.com issued a very uh, strong, positive response. Um, basic, that's where I saw it. That's where you saw it. That it was yeah, a, that's the first one. No well, I have NSTA flag in my news feed. Though, ah, so there that's you what go. pulled it in. There you go. <laughs> but they, they described it as no BS. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, I also was very amused to see a... Uh, uh, sharing of it in uh, Quebec, of all places. So oh, here is sure. a very similar article uh, on it, and it was all in French. So, <laughs> so you can translate. Does it do? Are the position statements in just English, right? They're just in English. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that might be something to think about in the future. It might. It might. So, yeah. but you know, it it's certainly you know making sure the teachers are aware of this, and then what they can do with this. Sure. are the next steps, you know. Well, we're going to use our show to point those teachers in the right direction. And uh, Eric, we thank you uh, so much for working on it, first of all, and then taking the time to talk to us today about it. Is there anything else you want our listeners to know about the position statement? Well, uh, this was a very talented group to work with. Uh, it was, it was, pro- this was probably one of the more challenging tasks I've had in a very long time and also one of the more rewarding, all because of the group. Uh, that, you know, saw common cause, saw common goal, and worked very well to produce this set of documents. Sure. Awesome. Great to hear it. Thank you so much for your time, Eric. All right. My pleasure. If you'd like to learn more about today's episode, head on over to our website, laboutloud.com, for more information. You can also find details about all the previous episodes, and you can leave us feedback and comments. We want to hear from you. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you've subscribed on iTunes, Google Play Music, or your favorite podcasting platform. And if you really enjoyed it, consider leaving us a rating or a review. Your feedback helps others find our show. If you like Lab Out Loud and you love the show that we provide for you, please consider supporting the show at our Patreon page. Head on over to patreon.com slash laboutloud for more information. Until next time, I'm Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell.